so to speak. There's actually a record of little sermon notes, jokes, anecdotes, stories, quotations, things that a pulpit or minister can use to comment on, that they can put together a perfect presentation, a beautiful sermonette, vignette, or missile, or some type of message, so that they could communicate effectively that which they think is going to bring you, if you're not saved, to God. Can I tell you something? It doesn't work. It's phony. It's false. It's a gimmick. It's an idea. It's something that's been contrived to drag you to the point of, oh, if we could just get them inside the doors, then we'll just witness to them until they're exhausted and we'll wear them down and wear them out and we'll get them to the place where they know at the end of the service there'll always be an altar call because we want the altar to have a call. You know, I mean, come on, let's get real. Isn't that why we're here? To get these people saved, you know. So all you people around them, pray for them because they raised their hand and said they were new. We know we've never seen them here before, so we need to work on them. I don't think so. You know, one of the most frustrating things I see when I read about Jesus is that I don't get the modern version of getting saved with the Jesus version of how he saved. As a matter of fact, I see great contradiction. People were told, hey, come to heaven or go to hell. You know, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Hey, come to me and I will heal you. Come to me. I don't see quite the same calling on our modern day evangelism for spiritual loss. Or, hey, we've got to drive home the fact that you are a sinner. Why? I think that Jesus and the fact that people, if they live like they know Jesus, would attract people to come to Jesus. I think if we live like we believe, then people want what we got. Jesus, I think, people came, sure, for miracles at times, and came for other reasons, but he didn't always say things that were pleasing for them to hear. You know? And so, I kind of wonder if uh, maybe the message is getting lost and that people are looking at the messenger rather than the words. Meaning, hey, if we got a great concert lineup, we've got ooh, them, and ooh, those, and ooh, some of these, and we put them all together, we make a nice presentation and we throw it at you. Oh, we're going to hook, line, and sinker. We've got the right hook. We've got the right fly fisherman. He's throwing that lure out. He's reeling them in. I don't know. I don't think that's right. I think you're just saving people that are already saved. And they're just getting saved again and again and again and again. I think when Jesus said that the fields are ripe with harvest and that we needed to pray that more people would go out to the fields to harvest in the harvest. I think I think he was talking about the world. I, I, I think there are people out there that want Jesus. But I think we're too busy, you know, harvesting the cultivated fields, the places that already have fruit, that really, maybe they're misunderstanding the gospel, or they've been religious, you know, and finally they're making, yes, I made that commitment, because this I understand different than I understood the last time I made my commitment. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. I know I never heard about Jesus, so when I got saved, 
Heck, I never heard about it before. Nobody came to my door knocking. Nobody taught me about God and religion. So I wonder sometimes if maybe, what happens if we're sharing the wrong message? We're glorifying the messenger and not the person of Jesus himself. Are we maybe obstructing the view and people aren't getting a better view of who God is because we're not following Jesus the way we should be? Are we the people of God? When I was a Jesus freak, I knew what I was like when I was walking in the spirit. <laughs> that peace, that joy, that love, that just couldn't be provoked. That even now you can invoke that same presence of God, and move in a realm that others don't understand, and they don't see. To be so heavenly minded that you're all earthly good and to have them say that you're no earthly good because you're heavenly minded. To be so in love with God you don't want to do anything else except be with God. You know, you say, hey, you know what? Let's go have a revival later. I want to go be with Jesus. I want to go talk to Jesus for a while. I want to <laughs> spend some time just listening. Just enjoying God for who he is. I wonder, have we lost our first love? and replaced it with evangelism, ministry, worship, church. Has the Jesus movement gone the way of religion and become a religious fundamentalist as opposed to a relation realist? Can you say, come to my house and we'll sit down and pray with Jesus? Can you say that we don't need a guitar, we don't need a worship leader, but we have Jesus so we can talk about him and share him in an intimate way? I wonder if maybe the message is getting lost, but the messenger is getting glorified. I wonder where Jesus is today. I wonder if he isn't out saving souls or we're busy saving ourselves. Sacramental service. We now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. The Christian worker has to be a sacramental go-between to be so identified with his Lord and Savior Jesus and the reality of his redemption that he can continually bring his creating life through his own life. It is not the strength of one man's personality being superimposed on another, but the real presence of Jesus coming through the elements of that person's life. To see them is to see Jesus. When we preach the historic facts of the life and death of our Lord, as they are conveyed in the New Testament, our words are made sacramental. God uses them on the ground of his redemption to create in those who listen that which is not created otherwise. If we preach the effects of redemption in human life instead of the revelation regarding Jesus, the result in those who listen is not new birth, but a refined spiritual culture an intellectualism of religion. And the Spirit of God cannot witness to it because such preaching is in another domain. We have to see that we are in such living sympathy with God that as we proclaim His truth, He can create in souls the thing which He alone can do, which is to cause that person to need, to want, and to see Jesus in the very words that we say and do. What a wonderful personality. What a fascinating man. What marvelous insights. What chance has the gospel of God to get through all of that? 
Oh, but they're such a child star. They memorize the scriptures and they repeat it and rolls out their tongue, quoting every chapter, verse, book, and title. Such eloquence, such King James. But what chance has Jesus to be seen in a little child preacher? What chance has the gospel of God to minister and to be ministered through all of that novelty and gamesmanship? It cannot get through because the line of attraction is always the line of appeal. If a man attracts by his personality, his appeal is along that line. As long as that person's speaking, they have our attention. As long as it's that musician, we want to go there. As long as it's the words we long to hear. If he is identified with his Lord's personality, then the appeal is on the lines of what Jesus Christ has done, can do, and will do for the person, in the person, and to the person, as Jesus comes into their life. The danger is to glory in men, and Jesus says we are to lift him up. I think it's obvious that in fundamentalist Christianity, in modern Christian worship, in modern preaching, which really is what it's about, it's not teaching. The Bible says that teaching would be the causing of a person to understand and to be instructed in knowledge so that they could search out and study with the cooperation of a teacher, instructing them and guiding them as they are cooperatively discussing it between themselves, even as the Jews taught that way. But the reality of what we do in modern Christianity is we preach. It's a preaching, and we call it expositional teaching, but that's not what it is. Because the, the, the bottom line is you have to just hear it. You're not allowed to participate in it. You're not allowed to talk about it. You're not even challenged to discuss it. But you're told to accept it as it is. Study on your own. But God's sakes, don't interrupt the service. For we don't want the Spirit of God to not minister to the crowds, to the thousands. God forbid that we have three people get together and discuss it among themselves. So teaching is not what we do. We preach the Word of God. And is that the sharing of Jesus? Or is it the glorification of man himself? Because in reality, the only person that knows is God himself, because we know that everyone operates according to what the Spirit of God leads them into and directs them. But have we made that leading of the Spirit of God an idol in some ways? Have we taken that which is holy and cast it down to the ground and trampled it under our religious footings by saying, we are the oracles of God? Or is the reality that we've forgotten how to share what Jesus has done, what Jesus is doing, and what Jesus has become in our personal life? Because frankly, the world has seen enough religious men. The world has seen enough of church history. The world is condemned by what Christians have done. But God has reached out and save the world through what Christians can do, which is to lift up what Jesus does in them and to them and for them based on what we cannot do for ourselves. Because if we're left to our own measures, we are not righteous, no, not one. But Jesus has become our righteousness. And if people can see in us Jesus, then we've done justice. We've done honor. We've done glory. We've done what Jesus wanted us to humble ourselves to do, which was very simple, very easy if we would just have done it from the beginning. Don't look at me, but look at Jesus, because I'm following him too. Maybe our message needs a little tweaking, because I'm sure 
our lives do. 